Welcome to the Business of Travel, the official podcast of the Global Business Travel Association. I'm Shauna Whitehead, representing the GBTA Meetings Committee, and I'll be your host for today's session. Today, I have the pleasure of kicking off part one of a three-part series focused on educating and maximizing opportunities for contractual negotiations and agreements in the m and space. We're going to talk more broadly in this first episode about the types of agreements that exist and provide some general direction on what you should leverage and when to maximize the negotiation opportunity and to make sure you're spending your time and effort where you can gain the biggest return on investment for your organization. Today, I'm joined by an expert buyer in this field, Donna Patrick from Abbott. Donna, thanks for joining us today. Would you mind just giving us a quick intro into yourself and your role at Abbott? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Donna Patrick. I work for Abbott. I just celebrated a year, my year anniversary uh, last month. Um, so here I am on my third SMM and starting from the bottom. <laughs> Glad to be wow. here. Happy anniversary. Thank That's you. Exciting. Um, so Donna, maybe to kick us off, would you just be able to maybe give us some sort of explanation um, to the listeners just around the key types of agreements that you're working on today and that you're using across your meetings and events supply chain? Sure. Yes, we um, we have uh, NDAs, which are um, not disclosure agreements, and those are to be utilized for any time that you're engaging with a supplier on a project that is not already uh, with a master services agreement with the company. Um, also, if there's an RFP, even if the supplier or suppliers are um, with an MSA, we send the NDA out as well, uh, just to be triple protected, I guess, from risk. Um, and, and speaking on behalf of the RFP out in the marketplace where we don't want that. Um, secondly, we have um, obviously the master services agreement or also known as MSA, mm -hmm. um, which is all of the terms and conditions surrounding um, the supplier and the engagement with Abbott. I'll go into the different types of MSAs that we're using as well, um, more into this conversation. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, a, a statement of work or also referred to as an SOW, and that always folds underneath the MSA. And then if it's a standalone, um, then again, it's a standalone statement of work. But that is required with my company, at least, with every single M&E project or engagement that we have with a supplier. Okay, cool. And then so just, I mean, maybe we talk about an MSA a little bit more. Just I know that it can be sort of a significantly heavy lift to put an MSA in place. So can you maybe give us a little insight into like, how do you assess whether to put an MSA in place or just maybe a standalone SOW, what are sort of the, the pros and cons of, of that type of agreement and the level of effort that's required when you think about putting that in place? It usually, um, with the companies that I've been at, um, the MSA is put in place if, it, if the supplier is part of your strategy. So if you are engaging with a dedicated um, event agency like BCD, I'll use as an example, um, we mm -hmm. would have a master services agreement, which talks about, um, like I mentioned, the terms and conditions, risk assessments, uh, security assessments, data um, protection, all of those key, um, you know, T's and C's that are that are part of most agreements, depending on the category or regardless of the category, I should say. Yeah. Um, we have different, as I was kind of outlining, we have different MSAs for different types of suppliers in the M&E space. So we have for hotels, we have certain um, MSAs that are for ho the hotel side because it's got, you know, the food and beverage uh, cancellation penalties, uh, deposit schedules, things that are very specific to a, a brand hotel. Mm -hmm. um, then we also have meeting and event agencies. So we have different um sets of terms and conditions that are specific to those types of suppliers, et cetera. Um, at Abbott, we are doing master services agreements when the volume dictates it, as mm -hmm. well as easy to, ease of use uh, to, to do business. So we have master services agreements with each of our, you know, the main hotel brands out in the, out in the marketplace. Um, it just makes it easier than to do, you know, try to negotiate terms and conditions each time that you have 
an agreement when we have to do it for each time. So it's a lot of um, back and forth, just alleviates that. Um, also to, you know, again, as part of your strategy, um, it, it helps with the partnership and with negotiating, pricing, um, concessions, uh, discounts, um, things like that. So it, it really serves as a way to really build your partnership. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, that's what I've seen. I mean, I think you're right. I think we commonly, we see obviously at an agency level, we have MSAs um, with our partnerships with clients. Um, we have a lot of clients that have these MSAs in with hotel chains as well, for sure. And then we're starting to see, um, we see a lot of production and AV MSAs as well in, but you're right in saying sort of that volume should really drive that and the willingness and, and and the willingness to partner as a part of your overall strategy is really what we see when we see the MSA. Um, and that typically mm-hmm. has, to your point, you know, all of the risk covered off, the contractual terms, and then you've got those SOWs that could be, you know, joined up or an, an, amend, an addendum to the MSA that then elaborates um, if you're expanding the partnership. So, I mean, talk about a little bit, if you could talk about the SOWs um, and what sort of terms you typically see in there, um, because I assume they're a lot uh, shorter than an MSA, right? And probably more business terms associated. Yes. And I I forgot to mention that for anybody, any supplier that we don't have an MSA with, we do addendum. We have an addendum with them. And it's a, a, a general service level addendum. But again, if they're not MSA'd, it's sometimes can be a little bit daunting going back and forth with that addendum and those terms and conditions in there. So it does make it easier with an MSA. The statement of work, the purpose of it is to truly outline the scope of work for Mm -hmm. that specific engagement, whether it's a hotel or, as you said, a um, audiovisual or production agency um, or or a meetings and events agency. So it it talks about the dates, um, the name of the event, the number of people, um, the, you know, key specifics around the event itself. And then um, there's some terms in there. So it it does outline specifically those um, deposits and penalties and things like that that are specific to that. But all the other um, T's and C's are covered under that umbrella of the MSA, which again is is ideal. Yeah, especially when that's that's the piece that, you know, sort of legal and security get involved in, right? That can be, can cause a lengthier process. <laughs> so good you have yes. sort of a backup in place with that general services agreement, even if it's an interim measure, right? As you're moving into an MSA, just so that you contractually have sort of some legalese and put in place, but not to the extensive nature of an MSA. Um, Well, and and another point I just wanted to, sorry to interrupt you, just to add um, to the hotel specifically side, is that um, the hotels for under a given brand um, either opt in or opt out, Mm -hmm. or they choose to opt in or or opt out to that MSA. And if they opt out, you know, unfortunately to them, we pull that from being sourced unless it's specifically asked to be sourced. And we start to move the share to the, um, you know, to the the hotel properties that truly want to be a partner and want to adhere to those um, terms and conditions. So it's helped a lot to kind of reverse, um, you know, given properties uh, wanting to opt out and they, and they, understand the importance of opting in and being a true partner, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, so that helps a lot. Total sense. And I get it too, right? I mean, you've got different levels of ownership at a hotel, you know, at a chain wide agreement, the property level is, is, you know, very diverse. So it makes total sense to have that opt in opt out strategy. And then you, you know, you truly know that you're covered when you're putting business with, you know, at a certain property level because of that opt-in process. So, yes. Yeah. And it's easier for the stakeholders to turn it around. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And, and I mean, right now it's key, right? Like we mm-hmm. see these, all of these options that are getting held and then like snapped up instantly and to have that legal piece of it taken care of and really just focus on the event details 
I mean, that's kind of what you need right now. Speed to market gets the availability. Um, so it's, yeah, it's game changing. Yep, 100%. Um, so just maybe if we move on, when we think about these agreement types, um, can we talk about some timeline considerations, especially at that MSA level, right? And and maybe a little bit about who needs to be involved in the process to make it as streamlined as pro- possible. Um, so can you maybe talk, Donna, a little bit about the key business stakeholders that you would engage in, engage with, really, in preparation for moving into an MSA negotiation? Yeah, I have a great example um, that just came up recently. I won't say the name of the brand, the hotel brand, um, but I lead what we call a um, M&E Center of Excellence at Abbott. And what that is, is a team of senior level event managers from across the company that are kind of the day-to-day help with the decision making, help with buy-in, help drive enhancing the program um, ongoing. And they came to me and asked if I would be willing to, you know, they know that it's a lot of work, um, but if I would be open to negotiating a master services agreement for a specific brand, the volume, I went and did the research, the volume and spend is there. And it's been daunting to try to negotiate with the various properties. This specific brand, the NSO or National Sales um, Account Director, said that all of their hotels have to opt in when they have an MSA. So there won't be any issues with any opt out or uh, people not you know, being partnership with it. Yeah. So um, we, we put it part of the strategy and we've been working through it for about a month. Um, what we're going to do is. We try to deal with it between the NSO and I to go back and forth with negotiations with my legal. If if they needed to be involved, they needed to be involved with one term, I think, and then their legal to approve it. And so we've been very successful kind of going that back and forth. It's Mm -hmm. critical. You know, I'm all about relationships. This is an industry of relationships, but I really um, grew the relationship with her through my year being at Abbott. And so it's it's been really seamless on her going back and explaining to her legal why something should be approved or why on my end it couldn't be. And we could, you know, change the verbiage just a little bit to, you know, make it more um, both sides. Um, Because I always I always believe in going into a negotiation where both, you know, there's somewhat equal appreciation on both ends, right? It it can't be one-sided too much. Um, So we're now down to the last stage. Um, There's a couple of key things that her and I are going to get on a call on Wednesday, as a matter of fact, and nail down. And they have waived, um, I can tell you guys who it is offline if you'd like, but they have waived the credit card um, fee if you're using a meeting card for all of their events. It's amazing. Um, And then there was one, uh, one of our offices that's really close to one of the properties under this brand that we, we had to kind of block for a little while until we get this done. And now they're going to be able to use them and they really want to use them. So it's a win-win for the stakeholders, for our legal teams, because of how we handled it, the NSO, and of course, um, you know, procurement side. So yep. it's a it's a bit of a success story. It's not until Wednesday, so we're not completely done yet. But it's <laughs> no it's really looking like yet, huh? yeah, no <laughs> celebrations yet. But it's I think it's going to be another game changer with availability and getting it done quickly. And my stakeholders will be happy. No, that's great. I think that's some great pieces of advice. Um, you know, and I've I've done that from an agency. Uh, standpoint as well, really trying to drive that conversation as much as possible to get the 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 agreement worked out and then working in the background with legal to massage it so that we've got that so that there's an understanding because they're not, you know, legal at different companies and aren't always purchasing the same sort of things. And honestly, meetings and events um, in a service industry is is sometimes just a little bit of a challenge without that con- context in the conversation. So I think that's some some great advice. And I know we, we're coming up to time, Donna. So I just, I think you just gave us some great advice, but is there, if you've got any listeners out there that are about to sort of put some more strategy and structured agreements in place across their meetings and events supply chain, do you have any final thoughts um, for those listeners about what 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 should be top of mind for them going into that strategy? 
Sure. Um, I think that if you don't report into a procurement uh, organization or uh, you just need, you know, kind of assistance, what I've done in previous roles is I've partnered closely with um, our agency. So like the BCD mm-hmm. um, to do to help with uh, we did a an RFP for um, MSAs and to be considered preferred. And it was really um, helpful, not only from information standpoint and and, uh, intelligence on the market and all of that, but Mm -hmm. also to kind of not be the middleman, so to speak. So the the agency kind of took some of the hard pieces um, for the client to um, kind of reap the the benefits of that, if that makes sense. So don't hesitate to partner with your, I'm not, I promise you, I'm not plugging (laughs) <laughs> CWC right. or uh, BCD at this point, but just, you know, the partnerships are all over and it's, we're in that relationship industry. So anybody that can be helpful is great and encouraged. Yeah, a hundred percent. And your partnerships will have the client's best interest. So absolutely yes. lean on that way you need to supplement for sure. Um, well, Donna, thank you for joining us today. I think this was like really helpful, a helpful overview and probably sets the stage for our next conversation. Um, so we will be following up shortly with the next session in our M&E series, which is going to be a further deep dive into the buyer perspective. And then we're going to follow up that session with a supplier deep dive. Uh, we want to just dig in a little further to both sides of that contracting process and help our audience to drive a better negotiated outcome for all of their partnerships. Um, You've been listening to The Business of Travel, the official podcast of the Global Business Travel Association. For more information about GBTA and its work, visit gbta.org. And be sure to rate and review us whenever you get your podcasts. Until next time, thank you for listening. 